Gracias. Moderating this panel will be Nabila Rashid. Uh, Dr. Rashid is a shareholder at McAndrews Held and Malloy, where she concentrates her practice on the acquisition and enforcement of IP rights. Dr. Rashid attained her bachelor's in biochemistry with honors from the University of Wales, Swansea, and she completed her PhD in biochemistry at the University of Liverpool. She then pursued two postdoctoral fellowships before making the switch to patent law. At that point, she came to Chicago Kent and earned her GAD. She was elected into the Order of the Coif here. Most recently, Dr. Rashid was elected by Mayor Emanuel to the Chicago Commission on Human Relations. Thank you, Dr. Rashid. Oh, how about now? Better? Excellent. Okay, I realize that our panel is what is going to be uh, keeping you between here and lunch, but I hope that we'll have a reasonably lively discussion and, um, and you won't notice the time go by. Um, I've got a fairly illustrial, illustrious panel here. Uh, first um, and foremost is uh, the Honorable uh, Paul uh, Grewal from the United States uh, Northern District of California. Uh, and he's been very instrumental in the publication of numerous local patent rules in that very active patent court over there. Uh, a graduate of the University of Chicago, he clerked first uh, for the uh, Honorable Sam Bell, followed by a clerkship with uh, Judge uh, Gayaza at the CAFC. Um, and after that, he went off to do a stint uh, in private practice at uh, the law firm of Day Casebeer, uh, and then was appointed uh, judge uh, in the Northern District of California in 2010. Um, our next panelist, and this is in no particular order, but our next panelist is uh, Professor Arti Roy, who doesn't need much further introduction uh, after her erudite comments from this morning. But just to briefly reiterate, uh, she has a wonderful mix of biochemistry and history from Harvard uh, um, as her background training, followed by a law degree from, from uh, the same institution. Um, and as she explained this morning, she has a keen interest in the intersection with between uh, administrative law and patent law, and I think that's going to play in very nicely with today's panel when we come to certain policy-type discussions. Um, um, and uh, that keen interest, which is going to be become ever more important in what she calls uh, the tapestry that's going to become woven in the coming years as we grapple with the new administrative procedures that have just recently, this month, been put into place with, uh, the, uh, with, with the new patent laws. Um, distinguished Professor uh, Laurie Andrews needs absolutely no introduction. Um, she has, uh, she, she's a prolific writer in the biotechnology arts. She's a graduate of Yale. She's been internationally recognized by every organization you can possibly think of, the World Health Organization, NIH, the DHSS, um, uh, the CDC, as well as innumerable foreign nations where she has been instrumental in commenting and advising on shaping healthcare and biotechnology policy issues. Um, and last, but by certainly no means least, uh, at the far end is uh, Mr. Singer, the head of the Life Sciences Litigation Department at Fish and Richardson, who assures me that he has been embroiled in this case for more years than, uh, than we decided to uh, uh, count. Uh, University of Chicago graduate, he's got significant bench and jury trial experience. He's very well recognized as a, lawyer, as a lawyer of the year in 2008 and 2010, and has also been recognized by uh, the uh, Chambers USA. So let's move to the actual subject at hand. Um, uh, as uh, Christy said earlier, we're talking about Mayo versus Prometheus. Um, arguably, relatively simple facts, but simple facts don't always give us uh, the easiest situation to grapple with. Um, I, th I dare say that the Prometheus case that was handed down has created a significant sense of discomfort amongst a very large section of the burgeoning diagnostics community in, uh, in the US and as well, as well as overseas. And it could very well significantly impact that new theragnostics industry that, um, that, that is at the intersection of therapeutic applications 
as they are affected by the initial diagnosis. Prometheus exclusively licensed certain medical diagnostic patents. These patents actually had a very simple recognition. They recognized that this type of drug called thiaprene drugs are great for the treatment of autoimmune diseases. Uh, but that recognition was all well and good, but due to the way that different patients, once the drug is taken in, due to the way different patients metabolize these drugs, it was utterly unpredictable as to whether a given dose that works for one person is going to be just as good for another person. So it's not one hammer fits every nail. So we are now at that point where the, the, the case is at the very heart of personalized medicine. How do you treat an individual patient with a piece of a personalized medical regimen? And that's really what is going to take us into the 21st century. The claims were very simple. The claims in the patent case were very simple. They had three steps. An administering, an administering step where the doctor administers the drug, a checking step, a, 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 a step to determine whether the blood, whether the, the drug is in the bloodstream and what are the metabolites, that are, that are the levels of the metabolites in the bloodstream. And then from those metabolites, trying to figure out whether the dose should go up or should go down. Very simple claim. Mayo used to buy these tests from Prometheus and run the tests to, and so that their doctors could personalize the regimen. But then what they did was they started, they developed their own, own uh, test and started using their own tests and stopped using the, 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 the tests that they'd licensed in from Prometheus and the litigation ensued. The holding that came down from uh, the, the Supreme Court simply was that these diagnostic methods are focused on laws of nature and that all that Prometheus has done is only added instructions as to how to apply those laws of nature. And so that's really the case in a nutshell. And so I think I'm going to throw the question open um, uh, to the entire panel. Maybe I'll uh, actually, maybe I'll start out with the last but not least and start out right at, right at the other end. Of, um, are you persuaded by Justice, Justice Breyer's explanation of how the correlation between metabolites in the blood and the likelihood that a given drug regimen uh, will be effective or is harmful, is that really a law of nature? What do we call a law of nature? Well, to, to answer your question, I hope I'm persuaded since, um, for those of you who don't know, I represented Mayo in the case uh, in its inception, <laughs> and it was, it was my idea to argue that it was a, a natural phenomenon, so I am persuaded, and, and it wasn't really, to, the interesting thing is I always thought that that would be an issue that would be contested um, more vigorously in the case below, uh, but it was not. Um, it was generally uh, conceded uh, that the drug, excuse me, that the metabolite um, the metabolite levels were, in fact, a natural phenomenon. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a question of whether I'm persuaded. I sure am. And the reason it really wasn't contested was because the, the metabolites themselves or the metabolic pathway had been described in the prior art uh, for about 30 years um, and had been known to be, uh, you know, the natural course of how the drug is metabolized in the prior art. And so the, the question was whether the particular levels that resulted in possible toxicity, let's be clear, it was possible toxicity and possible efficacy, whether those levels of those metabolites um, in your body, which your body then would react one way or the other, were those a natural phenomenon? And yes, I am persuaded by that. Mm -hmm. I'm persuaded as well, um, even though I didn't represent Mayo in the case, uh, because it's basically what the Supreme Court has been saying for 150 years, and there seems to be some fanfare, like, how do we apply this now? We're uh, in asking, um, how do we tell what's a law of nature? And in trying to answer that question, I would say, you think about what Justice Scalia asked in Metabolite, which is, what was invented by man here? So the drug was invented by man, you could get a patent on the drug, the reaction to it, even if it hadn't been described for 30 years, was a natural phenomenon, was a response uh, you know, not created by man. And, and Bilski and Fluke make clear that you have to consider what happens in nature to be part of the prior art. 
So in that sense, you're doing what you do about any patent case. You say, you know, if I invent a red wagon and someone invents a blue wagon with a different sort of material, how different is it from what went before and does it include an inventive act? I think some of the confusion has come from the fact that the patent provision in the Constitution itself says it protects discoveries. And then, you know, and so scientists just say, well, I discovered that the body does this. We didn't know about it before. Uh, but at the time it was written, discoveries meant something very different. Discoveries were a subset of what we now call inventions. And so I'll give an example of an actual friend of mine, an inventor. He was trying to invent a birth control substance. Instead, he, what he did, invented a fertility drug. You know, it didn't turn out quite the way he wanted, but it was still useful. <laughs> so if it had come to pass that he'd gotten the birth control pill, that would have been an invention. The other was a discovery. But for people who just note or find out or say for the first time that during your menstrual cycle, you're less likely to get pregnant at X day, that's a discovery of a, a law of nature, a fact that occurs. And it doesn't matter if I then find a super thermometer or a hormone test that can tell me what, where I am in the, cell cycle, in the menstrual cycle. I don't get a patent on the fact that having sex at a certain, certain time in the cycle you know, makes you less likely to get pregnant. So it's the difference between what's mad main and what isn't. So as, as long as we're uh, keeping score and being recorded, I, I'm always persuaded by superior courts. <laughs> <laughs> what? Wait till you get appointed to the federal circuit. <laughs> Don't change that. <laughs> Perhaps they have a different, uh, a different take on it. I, one, 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 one concern I have, though, or one, one thing that struck me in reading uh, the opinion was, was uh, Justice Breyer's discussion later in the opinion about the relative efficacy of judges and courts in assessing the breadth or, or narrowness of, of a particular law of nature, the strength of the law of nature. And it just struck me that if we are poorly situated to assess just how broad a law of nature really is, and I think that's essentially what the justice said, mm -hmm. and I tend to agree with him on that point, how are we any better situated to understand whether something is in fact a law of nature at all? And given the structure of the opinion and, of course, our obligation to make these determinations as a matter of law, perhaps uh, after the close of evidence, but certainly before trial, I think in most cases, uh, I have some concerns about how we're to make that call given uh, our resources and given our competency. So that, that did strike me. Mm -hmm. So picking up on that um, kind of administrative uh, uh, possibilities or the administrative um, realizability, if you will, of the approach. I do think that, unfortunately, uh, uh, the law of nature criterion is quite abstract, to use a term that was also used in a Supreme Court case, um, Bilski. Um, and uh, it, it, there is a little bit of the eye of the beholder um, uh, problem with it, which creates unpredictability, uncertainty, um, and how much you how much is wrapped around the law of nature appears to be the criterion by which one determines that one has gotten out of the law of nature box. Um, so, in a, uh, to use the terms in the opinion, if what is wrapped around the law of nature is more than well understood and routine, presumably then one is outside the law of nature box. But well understood and routine is also a complicated uh, set of questions. It's a complicated factual inquiry. So, um, I I'm concerned about administrability. So if we could just pick up on uh, a, a, an issue that's, that's come out of uh, at least three of the panelists. We, we've gone back to Bilski. We've gone, Bilski's been mentioned a couple of times. And Bilski did lay out or tried to lay out uh, what seemed to be a con concrete machine and tra or transformation test. Where do you go along the Bilski line from a computer case and how do you transform that into uh, one of these, as I say, personalized medicine cases? What is it that you add to the claim as a practitioner to make something that is patent ineligible to being patent eligible? What would you add? Well, let me, let me take a crack at that with respect to the, the Prometheus claim, mm -hmm. so long as I'm not, not bound by any comments uh, <laughs> that I make. 
the, the essence, I think, and someone described the natural phenomenon as your, your body's reaction to the drug, and, and that's what they were trying to claim, which, which I agree with. The, the essence of, of the Prometheus claim is I would say, well, why don't you put your money where your mouth is? And if you believe that these levels that you've identified are truly toxic indicators and efficacious indicators, then draft a claim that actually covers that. You know, a method of treating the disease wherein you give the drug uh, and you result in metabolite levels that are in this defined range. That, in my view, is, is if you will, giving a new method of treatment that's applying the natural phenomenon. Mm -hmm. It's applying the levels of toxicity and applying those levels of efficacy to the treatment of disease. It's not trying to claim the natural phenomenon itself or really effectively claim the natural phenomenon itself. If people disagree with you, um, if you don't, they don't think those numbers are right, um, and they're different in other subsets of patients and other subsets of diseases, they're free to design around um, your claim. And that was the fundamental, you know, one of the fundamental problems in the Prometheus case is there was no ability to design around that claim. And that's really where the case started. Mayo had designed a test it thought was a better test that used different numbers, yet it was, if you will, blocked by a claim that was so broad as the courts found, to claim the natural phenomenon of the association between toxicity and metabolite levels and efficacy and metabolite levels. So from the Prometheus perspective, that, that's how I would do it. I would turn it into a real method of treatment claim. And I've, I've heard people talk about adding steps to the end. I'm not sure that that's really going to get you there, um, depending on what steps you might add. But actually, as I said, put your money where your mouth is. You know, if you think you've got some levels of something in the blood that are aids in treatment, well, make it a method of treatment that fixates on those levels. Um, and you know, if someone doesn't use those levels, they don't infringe. Um, and that's the price you pay. So maybe your claim is narrower, right? I think there was, you know, is this a bad claim drafting? And I, I don't know if it's bad. It, it worked for their purposes. They got eight years of exclusivity. Um, but make your claim narrower if you want it to survive 101. And I think that invent around is really crucial um, in, uh, and it seems that several of the justices have focused on that. So in the metabolite case where 101 was not raised, um, you know, someone had invented a, uh, a test for a particular level of homocysteine in the body and also noted that it was related to vitamin D deficiency. Someone came along with a more, Abbott came along actually with a more efficient test. Uh, it was, it, it had, you know, it was a better predictor, it cost less money, and yet it couldn't be used because their claim was assay, this bodily product, and, you know, note that uh, a high homocysteine level indicates vitamin D deficiency. A couple questions come out of that, since you wanted to go in the policy realm. You know, do I want my doctor every time, you know, not to be able to tell me that, and that was the issue in that case, because the Federal Circuit said publication of that biological fact induces infringement, and so my doctor thinking about that connection after he or she had done any assay of any type. But the justices, you know, even Justice Stevens was saying, do you mean if I invent a better test, you can still stop me from using it because of that relationship? And I think that's uh, one of the things that will be key with um, the Myriad case with the isolated uh, DNA, you know, because you can't invent around the breast cancer gene in terms of diagnostics, treatment, and so forth. So to bring it around to policy and personalized medicine, I use an asthma inhaler. Um, and uh, obviously that's an a patented product. Um, the company that makes it has filed for a patent mm -hmm. on the gene sequence that will predict whether it works in a person or not. So why would they do that? Well, because you can make a lot of money selling inhalers to um, people for whom it doesn't work because it takes a few months to determine that um, whether you, it'll work on you or not. So they've said for the 20 years of the patent, they won't let anybody offer that test. It's clearly a health benefit. It's a, you know, it would be uh, useful, but by owning that biological fact, um, they can keep marketing things to people that they that they don't work for. So the, the very value of personalized medicine may not be given to me if that sequence is patented. 
But it's not that they won't allow anyone else to commercialize it. They, won't, they, they, won't they said they won't offer it themselves. They said in a Wall Street Journal article, we're not going to offer the test or let anybody else because it cuts our market down. But then that brings in, again, to the public policy issue, then that brings in uh, better policing of, in certain other jurisdictions, in, in many other countries. You have to work You have pattern. to work the pattern. We don't have that here. And though. so that brings in a public policy concern of whether or not you should have um, a, a discussion about compulsory licensing, that if you've got a patent, you have to work it within, I think it's in India, it's three years, in Australia, mm -hmm. it's five years, so on and so forth. So I think that there are, we are getting to that point, again, uh, I'm going to talk, uh, turn to uh, Professor Arati in a minute, that, you know, administrative law coming into policing what the patents are there to protect. The patents are there to protect a certain valued intellectual property. Now, what we do with the public policy concerns, we need to get, we can't have the FDA standing, standing back and saying, no, 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 we don't want to touch the patent issues. We can't have these other administrative agencies saying we don't want to have anything to do with it. Really, at some point, surely all of the administrative agencies need to come in and have a cohesive statement of how they're going to approach this policy. So I think there are two um, policy issues that are of interest here, at least two. Um, one is the breadth question. I think that part of what the Supreme Court is frustrated about with respect to these patents is that they seem quite broad, notwithstanding the fact that at the end of Justice Breyer's opinion, as uh, Judge Graywell mentioned, he. Um, he was uh, very modest about saying that we can't distinguish between broad laws of nature and narrow laws of nature. I think what was really bothering the justices in this case and in the LabCorp case, um, to the extent they addressed the question, was the breadth issue. And in, for those of you who do patent law, you know that typically patent lawyers think of breadth as a Section 112 issue. Section 112 doesn't really get at the sort of breadth problem that is being um, raised in this case, um, arguably in this case anyway, uh, although there was some narrowing of breadth, there were some numbers on uh, levels, so it had to be above 400 mm -hmm. before you got toxic, yeah. and you know, so it wasn't as if they put no numbers in. Um, but you know, the, 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 the policy concern is, I think, to a significant extent, the breadth one, and um, whether judges are in the best place to determine that a claim is too broad, not because it hasn't been enabled or described or all the Section 112 concerns, but simply because it, it is really hard to invent around or would be impossible to invent around. I'm not sure, because they're not scientists, they, you know, what can be invented around in any given situation is very fact specific, and so they would presumably have to evaluate competing factual claims. Um, that goes then to the, the next issue of well, so if a particular patentee has a very, very broad claim and we decide that we don't want judges to determine that it's too broad and is preventing too much research from going forward, are there other administrative organs that could, or are there administrative organs that could make those determinations? And most other countries do have um, doctrines of either working the patent or experimental use or all sorts of other doctrines that provide safety valves in the system. For better or for worse, we in the US have thus far not exercised any of those safety valves in any systematic way. And one question that could be raised is whether we need some safety valves other than 101, um, because 101 ends up, could end up being a bit of a blunderbuss with respect to what judges could do with it. Yeah. There's, there's, of course, I think the, an issue that is of some interest right now regarding whether 101 is even properly litigated in the district courts as an invalidity defense under 282. I just wanted to go back to Bilski for a moment mm. because I, and, and offer one further thought, which is, I don't know about most of you in this room or on this panel, but I think the, the general consensus, at least my, my interpretation of Bilski was that in many ways it was kind of an easy case, right? I mean, even the Federal Circuit killed that one. Um, and, and, and so I think it was a reasonable read of Bilski or, or coming out of Bilski to say, well, you know, the, the implications for software patents remains to be seen. Um, I, think, I think your case, I think this case really does change the game for software and raise the question whether throwing an algorithm into silicon or into binary code achieves those additional steps or, or 
uh, points of novelty that are not 102 issues, but are 101 issues, at least as Justice Breyer has, has laid out. Um, uh, I, I think it's fair to say I have a very unscientific read of, of at least my district, but since this case, I, you know, we, we have, we have uh, granted motions to dismiss and motions for summary judgment um, in software cases on patentability grounds, and this, this decision has, has, has been featured front and center. So I think there will be significant implications outside of the personalized medicine realm going forward. I think before we go to the next question, just a, just a comment that if you look at the two industries since the 1980s that have been the engines of progress in this country, you've got the software industry, industry the electrochemical arts, and then you've got the biotech industry that have, that have really uh, increased the GDP of this country and that have really had significant impacts. On, on the standing of this country as a, as, 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 as a world leader in industry. They've, they're, at a, they're at a push and a tug between each other and the case law that develop, that's developing in the software arts is having an impact on the biotech arts and vice versa. And really it's a one patent system that, fit, that should fit all, but you know, sometimes it doesn't work as well. Sometimes it, it just doesn't work as well. Um, the question that, I, that uh, I wanted to go on to, and I think I'm going to uh, uh, go back to Judge uh, 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 Graywall, is this, this idea of conflating 101 with the other sections of the statute. If you read 101 as a statutory provision, it has that last clause that says subject to other provisions of this statute. And so traditionally, we have always looked at 101 as being a hoop to jump through or a low bar to jump through. Arguably, in the last three years, essentially, the 101 bar has been really significantly raised to the point that the rest of the statute has, has become subsumed in the 101 question, and perhaps... Uh, you and the rest of the panel could comment on that a little. Well, uh, I, the only other comment I would offer is that uh, um, I, I think it's I think the the Supreme Court has made clear that what, regardless of uh, what the government had urged, I think it was the government in their brief that urged uh, pretty strongly that these issues are best handled as 102 or 103 novelty or obviousness type assessments. That that position was clearly rejected. That that those those determinations are relevant to a 101 assessment. The, the practical concern that uh, I have, and you know, we'll do what we're told, that's what we do in the trial courts. Uh, the practical concern I have though is as a, as a matter of trial management, right? So we, we traditionally have left, in most cases, uh, 102 and 103 issues to the jury. And so it has always been a, qu a, a, a question I have posed to my juries uh, whether the patents are in fact novel or, or non-obvious over, non over the prior art. Well, as I read this opinion, that issue is now not merely a jury question, but also a question for the court. And you know, that, the consistency of that approach, of course, is one issue that we all are going to have to wrestle with. The, the real thing that scares me to death is the potential inconsistency of a determination I might make or another judge might make and what the jury would and, and how to reconcile all that. You put all that against the backdrop of the administrative entity and our supposed deference to, we, we're, we're to give to the to the PTO on certain questions of this nature, uh, particularly in light of eye for eye and the like. It gets very complicated very fast just in terms of what it is we're supposed to tell the jury they're supposed to decide, what it is we're supposed to decide uh, as a matter of law. Mm -hmm. Well, I would disagree that the 101 bar has been raised. I think it's where it's always been. I think that people filing patents have gotten more avaricious about what they've claimed, and biotechnology has allowed us to learn more about natural processes. You know, so, so think about the sort of things. And we're also seeing areas where it conflicts with other rights, like the First Amendment. You know, so, um, you know, patents on business methods that allow you to patent the use of an existing tax law. Why shouldn't everybody have access to tax law? And yet I know firms in Chicago who have paid from their probate departments to use tax law in a certain, um, in, a, in, in a certain way. And so what this is getting at is, is really, um, I don't think it works by just a limit in scope because it's a prior question as to even whether something is an invention. And, and so 
And, and, and so here's an example. Um, Four million babies a year are tested for the level of fetal protein uh, in the mother's blood. And it was known for a long time, if you had a high level, you might have a neural tube defect. That fact was not patented, testing was going on. Then someone noticed that there were more babies who had, um, you know, who had a low level who were born with Down syndrome and patented that correlation. So a test that everybody's been doing, uh, that biological correlation is now noticed, and he sues the doctors who are doing the four million births a year. Uh, give me royalties. They're going to do this. They're going to do this for that other purpose. But now that biological fact is out of the bag, and you can't help but think that. If you're a doctor, you can't help then think, oh, a low level means that. So there was no new technology involved, you know, no machine or transformation, and yet that patent was issued. I don't think 102, 103, 112 can do the job of 101 because the reason we love laws of nature, facts of nature, E equals M squared, the plant in the wild, is because they are novel, non-obvious, and useful. We're going after facts, laws of nature, because they're, they're useful. And I also um, don't see the patent office doing that good a job of applying traditional standards in life science cases. I had a federally funded project where, uh, with patent examiners, with PhDs in molecular biology, and with an advisory panel from around the country, we looked at gene patent claims for um, six different uh, types of disorders and found 38% didn't even meet the normal standard of, um, of the novelty, not obvious, useful enablement, and so forth. One person had patented. So figure the breast cancer gene is less than 100,000 base pairs. Had patented everything in the genome from this base pair to one 12 million later. Anything that was you know, discovered by anybody else. Or people were getting patents on the correlation. Be any gene therapy later invented with their gene sequence. So th those, even the traditional hurdles haven't been so hard to you know, get over in the patent office. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that, that the Patent Office does not do a very good job. I think everyone agrees about on that, which makes the I4I decision a difficult one, kind of independent of whatever has happened with um, Bilski and, and Prometheus and so forth. Uh, so there are multiple issues going on here, unfortunately, for the poor trial courts that have to address all of this. Um, that said, I do think that one of the problems that we have in our current patent system in the U.S. is that there are no safety valves, just to reiterate that point. Um, in copyright, we have fair use to address First Amendment questions, to address the rights of scientists to think as they want and, you know, and, and do what they want, whereas we have no safety valve, according to the Federal Circuit, at least thus far, in the patent law. And, you know, it seems to me that 101 is now taking on the role in part, at least, that other safety valves could play better. Hey, let me just let me just make make one comment. I'm going to rush to Justice Breyer's defense here. I, I, if you read the opinion, he didn't think he was conflating 103 with 101, and I think he freely admitted that he might be conflating 102 with 101 in making the judgment that the first two steps of the method were in the prior art. And it comes back to, in in my view, is I mean, if you buy the notion that these natural phenomena should not be patented. So that's a, a first principle, and plenty of my partners don't. <laughs> they tell me, you know, why shouldn't I be able to patent E equals MC squared if I'm the first person to discover it? But let's leave that aside. If you buy that notion that those things are not patentable, why on earth should we have them be patentable if they're simply appended to something that is indisputably in the prior art? Why does that suddenly become okay and get over the 101 hurdle that I've appended something we all agree is not patentable to a method that previously existed in the prior art and end up with Lori's problem, which actually happened in the Mayo case. I mean, that's one of the sort of the yeah. undercurrents which wasn't in any of the opinions. And I'll just tell you a little story and then, then let the panel go on. The, there was a doctor at the Mayo Clinic who was trying to develop levels, if you will, of these metabolites for different diseases than the doctors in Canada had studied them for. She's a dermatologist. Uh, and these drugs were also useful in treating these horrific uh, skin diseases, disfiguring diseases that were autoimmune diseases. 
she was doing research to try to figure out, okay, I've read about this uh, levels of these things maybe indicating efficacy and toxicity. You know, maybe in my diseases it, it's relevant as well. Um, and so she was doing that research, got funded by the, the internal review board at Mayo to do the research and, um, and did it. Um, and as she was giving the blood to the Mayo lab to test, the technician, a clerk, essentially, a non-skilled person, noticed that some of the levels were above the numbers he'd heard about from all this years of, of use of the Prometheus test. And so he told her, he said, hey, uh, this number has been noted as high. She says, and what her testimony was in her deposition was, you know, she was asked, well, did you consider that in treating it? Did you think about that information that you were given by this clerk who remembered it from the tests that Mayo had been using from Prometheus over the years. And her answer at deposition was, I cannot rule it out that I didn't consider it. So she said, I might have, I might have not, but I can't say I didn't. And according to Prometheus, and I think it's right, that became patent infringement because this ability to think about this relationship which was in every journal on the land suddenly became infringement for using something that had been in the prior art for years. So, you know, my perspective, you know, Judge Graywell, if, if I could urge you to think about this, is listen to, you know, what Justice Breyer is saying. He's saying 102 might be conflated because you have to consider if these steps are new and are, in that way, conventional. But I'm not, I don't think he's saying that if the two steps had never been combined before, but had just been obvious to combine, that we then go to the 101 inquiry. We might, that's where we might end up from some of the language, but I don't, I don't think that's what, he's, that's certainly what we weren't, we weren't arguing that. Um, we were trying to make the point that, you know, controlling and policing people's thoughts is a really bad idea. And saying you should be able to do that by appending those thoughts, which are a natural phenomenon, thinking about a natural phenomenon to a pre-existing uh, method is a bad idea and fails the hurdle under 101. So I could go on. I, I won't, I won't that it take up any more of that, but that, that really to me is the fundamental issue that he's trying to flag in there. And the conflation issue, I think people have sort of blown that out of proportion by his use of the word, I think, conventional. Mm -hmm. it, he wasn't using it. I don't think he was using it in a 103 sense. I think he would have said so if, if that's what he meant, a smart guy. I think that's a, that's a very interesting point of clarification that, that, um, that when you're looking at conflating uh, prior art into the 101, issue that really what the litigants were arguing was on the 102 issue, not the 103 yeah. issue. And I think, you know, yes, that comes out if you read the transcripts. I'm not sure that that comes out as well if in, in the opinion. Yeah. And, no. Look, some of the language, it could have been, I think, tighter, I think yes. is what we would say. Mm -hmm. And I, one other thing I will, I will share is that you know, the, the Federal Circuit, and is it the King, King Pharma case, is that right? You know, they're, they're, they're essentially applying the same test under 102. Mm -hmm. And I was at the Solicitor General's meeting where we, I don't know if it, those of you who've been involved in the Supreme Court, you, you show up at the Justice Department and any lawyer that works for the government that wants to come and quiz you, quizzes you. It's, it's, a, it's like the world's worst oral argument. It's like <laughs> 25 member panel from every institution that, that we have. Um, but the, the PTO was strongly in favor of the King Pharma approach and I, I said, well, I'm not sure that that's any better than the 101 approach because it's the same approach. Are these two steps in the prior art and then are you just appending a natural phenomenon to it? And by the way, I don't think that's supported under the case law under 102 either. You know, where you just take that last step and say, which is what King Pharma says, I give it no patentable weight. That's their test. We give that last step no patentable weight. I'm like, well, where, where'd that come from? I mean, since when do we take steps out of claims and give them, quote, no patentable weight? Under the 101 test, at least, it's intellectually um, more consistent with the Supreme Court's past authority. And I do agree with Lori that the bar hasn't been raised. It's just been reapplied. You know, it's, it's, a, it's an old, and I'll, I'll say one last thing and shut up, is, you know, 101 is the patent law as far as the Supreme Court is concerned. If you go back into their history, I mean, they've created half of the patent statute by looking at 101. I mean, 103 arose out of 101, something I learned um, doing this case. I had no idea that 103 came out of 101, and then Congress passed 103 to codify all the Supreme Court law under 101. So I'm a big advocate for 101 as a, someone said, a, as a safety valve 
if you will, for <laughs> dealing with these problems that are not, you know, they're not readily apparent when Congress passes statutes as to what to do with this very broad, broad patent, uh, broad patent eligibility provision and treating it that way and giving it ability to grow over time isn't such a bad thing. So that's, I mean, it is interesting to think about 101 as a safety valve as contrasted with uh, some sort of equivalent of fair use or whatever we have in copyright because one could, could view it that way. Um, I don't think that's historically how it emerged exactly, although you're right that the Supreme Court certainly um, uh, has developed a huge amount of case law around 101. Of course, it is um, patent common law. It's not really, it's not from the statute per se. It's Supreme Court patent common law, which is fine. But um, as a consequence, I think when the Supreme Court exited the arena for a long time, people thought that common law was kind of no longer particularly important. And so one of the issues that comes up that I've written about is, um, so for, let's say, you know, several decades, the Supreme Court has just exited the area. When it comes back and issues decisions like Prometheus, those decisions have a retroactive effect upon um, existing uh, rights. And whether or not those existing rights are granted properly, people have, have been um, working under certain assumptions with respect to those rights. And so it's unfortunate the Supreme Court has to come in so late in the game um, and and I think that retroactivity is a real issue, and I know David Schwartz has written about that as well. Um, it's interesting because in the I4I case, they, they were reluctant to overturn the clear and convincing evidence standard because they, they talked about how this would unsettle all these rights that had already um, been vested, whereas they had no such concerns in Prometheus, apparently. Uh, you know, as far as um, whether these, uh, whether these questions are best answered under 102 or 103 or under 101, I don't, again, I'll, I think you know, time will tell. And I, I, I tend to agree with you. Perhaps practically, there won't be all that much of a material difference with this opinion out there. I, I, I for one, however, would be much more thrilled about uh, a novelty analysis under 101 if, for example, the justice had thrown a bone mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to the factual findings that are inherent in that evaluation and perhaps suggested that unlike in claim construction, we were entitled to at least a little bit of deference to the Federal Circuit. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't see fit to do that. Well, I mean, this is all an important point about what the settled expectations are, since that's going to influence what happens in, uh, in Myriad. And, uh, you know, at the very start of the whole biotech life science phenomenon, 101 was reiterated in Chakrabarty that, you know, using that very language of not, you know, no plant in the wild, no equals MC squared, that you need to have something that performs in a way that it didn't in nature. So I would argue everybody was on notice, uh, you know, and there were many things being written saying that gene sequences should not be patentable at the start. And so when the Federal Circuit, when Justice Moore said, let's not upset settled expectations here, what she called settled expectations, I would call unjust enrichment, you know, because you were on notice. <laughs> You got a lot of, you know, you were able to, you know, they had a charge a high rate. They had a, you, you had a, a good, um, a good run, and just like, you know, slaveholders had settled economic expectations when we switched that. Um, you know, I don't find it to be that persuasive in the patent area either. So, so oh, just, um, and it's it's also important to keep in mind, um, you know, the flip side of the question: to what extent are um, economic incentives provided by these sorts of patents on diagnostic methods, for example, are really essential for dissemination. I, I, I tend to be um, think about these issues very pragmatically in law and economics terms. And so it's very hard for me to get my uh, mind around what law of nature means, but I can get my um, mind around whether these patents are really important. and. One of the reasons I'm a little bit less concerned than I might be otherwise is that I haven't seen evidence from the empirical literature that diagnostic um, patents have been really critical for purposes of, of dissemination of this information. You know, and in fact, it seems the opposite, like with the hemochromatosis gene patent, where laboratories were already testing for it before the patent surfaced, and then, in fact, it, you know. So this is unlike development of a drug, when you say have a gene sequence patent, where it might take you, take an Abbott, $820 million to get it through the FDA. 
you discover a gene sequence and you can start testing the next day. And so part of the, you know, and it's also something through the Human Genome Project, we've been, you know, spending in some years 1.8 billion of federal funds to uh, encourage scientists to look for gene sequences. So the economics, I think, are very different in here than maybe in, it would be in gene therapies or other, other areas. Well, the interesting thing about the economics question is that if you've looked at the, the last few J.P. Morgan conferences, and if you look at what Stephen Burrell is doing in the Burrell Report, and he keeps coining this term of theragnostics and therapeutics, and you know, combining, and, and this goes back to uh, the, the, the comment that uh, uh, Mr. Singer was making earlier about if the claim had been rewritten as a combined therapy with that diagnostic range within the claim. So it's a therapy claim, but it's got the diagnostic uh, rolled into it. This, this field of theragnostics is being recognized, and the value of it, the economic value of it, perhaps not so much in this country, but the MENA countries and the countries overseas where the rise in disorders such as diabetes is exponential and to come up with a therapeutic and a diagnostic regimen that is personalized to the particular population classes is taking on that economic question. So I think that's the debate that's ongoing at the moment. And it, and it is how economics conflates into that personalized property right. So that is ongoing. Um, and I think I, uh, I'm looking at our timekeeper, but I'm going to like throw out a really softball question before we open it up to, to, to everybody else. Uh, do you think the Supreme Court is going to take on Myriad? Uh, yeah, Myriad. And what's the impact going to be of what Prometheus has already done? Well, I certainly hope so. And, um, and so Myriad has three, basically three types of claims on the isolated gene sequence, so the ATCG, et cetera, um, taken from the body, on any 15 base pairs within the breast cancer gene sequence. So that is huge because if that claim stays, you know, those 15 base pairs appear in every other gene in the body and, and really would give Myriad the right to collect royalties or have uh, exclusive control over all these other genes where they haven't done the research. Um, but another claim is um, the, based on the correlation between a gene sequence and breast cancer. Uh, the claim is that if you take a patient sequence, like say mine starts out ATT and a normal one is ATC, the claim is over comparing those two. So the kind of mental step and in fact, that one went down at every level because it was entirely metal steps. And then a claim that looks very much like Prometheus. It's about administering a drug to uh, a, an engineered cell line that expresses the cancer to see if that drug slows the, the cell rate. And what we have at the federal circuit level is that Lori is, uh, Judge Lori is saying, even just taking the gene out of the body to isolate it, which of course is going to affect everything because you can't do research on the gene, you can't do diagnostics. You know, I can't take the breast cancer gene from my body, have a doctor look at it, have a give it to a researcher to do research on, because any any isolated form of the gene falls within this patent. Um, Judge Laurie said that that's patentable because the invention is breaking the covalent bonds. Isolation requires breaking of covalent bonds. Uh, Judge Bryson said, well, you know, if the breaking of chemical bonds, which isn't even in the patent, you know, it is described in terms of its sequence, not in terms of the chemistry, um, made it patentable, then uh, clear things that where patents haven't been allowed, like the elements on the periodic table, lithium, to remove that requires the breaking of ionic bonds. You know, it, would, it proves too much in a way. Um, and then Judge Bryson also said, well, you take out a kidney, you, and, and that causes, you know, changes, and you have to be pretty savvy to do it, and yet you don't own all kidneys where you could charge a royalty 
uh, every time someone does a kidney transplant. Um, so uh, uh, Judge Bryson would find the gene sequence unpatentable. And, and Judge Moore, you know, was um, getting a little miffed in oral argument and said, is this really your best shot that you knew where to cut? You know, because that, you know, doesn't sound too um, persuasive. And so, but, but she said if she was, you know, deciding on a blank slate that, you know, she would perhaps not find this to be patentable but made the settled exploit expectations argument. So one key thing that will go up is how much deference is owed the patent office. Mm -hmm. I mean, she, she, she says it is owed. Uh, you know, Judge Bryson said, you know, no, we don't owe uh, deference. The case law is such that you owe deference if there's, at some level, if there's been a thorough assessment. Well, what did the patent office do? It started granting patents on gene sequences based on Pasteur's patent on uh, yeast and um, the learned hand decision in Park Davis on isolated and purified adrenaline. Um, was that thorough enough? It turns out Pasteur never enforced his patent. He gave it to the public good. So we don't know whether that was a valid patent or not. Uh, Park Davis would still have allowed uses of the natural substance of adrenaline and arguably failed to apply the Supreme Court law in American Wood Paper. And I found a very interesting 1937 article in the journal Science. And there, uh, Pascale Federico, who later was the commissioner of patents and who was the primary draftsman of the 1952 Patent Act, said, after American Wood Paper, it is unlikely that those sort of patents, the Pasteur patent, would be ever granted because they uh, because of the Supreme Court precedent saying even if you isolate and purify, it doesn't make it enough substance even if you make a synthetic version. So that's what's at issue in the case. Um, and it already went up once. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, vacated in light of Prometheus. Um, the Federal Circuit decided again, John Conley did a great um, uh, 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 track change version which showed that the Federal Circuit did things like move the word however over three places in a, in the, you know, where the holding was essentially the same as before. So I think the Supreme Court might get annoyed enough to look at it again. Yeah, I think just as a practical matter, the fact that they issued the same opinion again and there's a very um, uh, cogent dissent by Judge Bryson who is very well respected, I think that will, and not last but not least, the. Um, the government is on the side, to some extent at least, of the ACLU, um, which is a, a significant indicator for Supreme Court review. Um, the Supreme Court historically looks very closely what the SG has to say, and in this case, they're not siding with the Patent Office. And I think, if I may, open it up to the, unless sure. there's comments. Or no, questions. that's fine, that's fine. Uh, I'll open it up to the audience. This is a question for Mr. Singer. How do you see uh, the Prometheus decision playing out in the, in the software industry? That's a great question. Um, I, I think Judge Graywell actually spoke to that. Certainly in our cases, um, in our firm, um, there was already a, a pretty heavy focus on it from our firm since we've been handling um, the Mayo case, but the level of focus has gone higher, if you will. The, the question I have is what threshold issues will the court deal with and what threshold issues will um, the court defer to the fact finder, and which for most cases, of course, is the jury. Um, that's what I think we're most interested in, um, and I've, I've given sort of my opinion as to sort of where the dividing line falls um, from Justice Breyer's opinion, but that's what we are really focused on. Who is going to decide this? Is it going to be decided by judges or going to be decided by juries because there are fact disputes. Even in the Prometheus case, there could have been a big giant fact dispute over whether or not that thing was a natural phenomenon. Um, but for whatever reason, it didn't, it didn't arise. So it's going to be a very important issue. We see it in many, many cases. We are filing motions uh, to invalidate and defending motions, <laughs> as the case may be, not to invalidate. So very active.
So let me play devil's advocate for a minute. So Jose Rivera from the last panel from Abbott, he had to leave, but he made this point, and I just wanted to raise it and get reactions from the panel. So if we take the position uh, that these correlations that were at issue are just natural laws, not patentable, then um, I think Mr. Rivera would say that there's no financial incentive for any private company to try to spend money and develop them because anybody can use them once they do. And it's not like these correlations, you know, even if they are natural, uh, natural laws or natural phenomena, even, even if they are, it's not like they're all self-evident. They only become evident because somebody else, you know, some researcher spends time and, and finds them. So it kind of is what Professor Rye said. Professor Rye said she didn't see any empirical evidence that patents help dissemination, but I think I might kind of further refine that to say that, you know, the question is whether patents actually encourage, like, the discovery, the invention, whatever we, word we want to use, not just dissemination, but even, like, uncovering them. So um, I'll just jump in. And I'll say, you know, that's an interesting question. So a lot of this research on, on diagnostic um, methods and correlations has been done through federal funding in the public sector. And, and in the biotech industry, there's a very interesting uh, synergy between public funding and what the private sector does. Um, it, it's quite possible that as these correlations become more and more expensive to find and or if in the future some of these correlations will have to um, go through the FDA approval process in order to um, uh, to be dis disseminated because uh, currently they really don't because they're not um, subject to FDA approval for the most part, um, then things may change. And so, yeah, I think the, the economic question is a moving target, absolutely. I was going to say there's two, two things I would say. There's, there's a big difference between the, as you pointed out, the, the drug industry with its barrier to entry at the FDA and the diagnostic area. It's a, a Big difference. That's to say nothing in the software industry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but, but then also the, there's a, um, just the Prometheus case is a great example. I mean, that was a university discovered uh, correlation. And so you also have to remember the structure of the actual implementing industry is also very different, whereas drugs are developed, manufactured, and pervaded by big companies because of the investments that are needed. It's often the case that diagnostic tests, um, because of the, you, yeah, you have commercial hospitals, but then you have Lots of research institutions have their own hospitals who bring these correlations that they've developed themselves um, to the public. So I, I think the structure of the industry is very different. And I, I'm going to defer to the, to the political scientists and all that about the actual impacts, but I just comment that the structure of the drug industry is very different than the structure of, of sort of the diagnostic sector. So the question at heart is what do we need for innovation? So. Would gene sequences have been discovered if we didn't offer patent protection? And at the start of the Human Genome Project, the key scientific researchers in the area said, don't grant intellectual property because it will hamper things. You know, because we're not just talking about, you know, one gene sequence, so diabetes, 60 different genes, different mutations, if everybody's got a patent on that. And, and the fact that in the, um, in the Myriad case, you know, all the groups that are the ones who are going to be looking for the correlations and the genes have filed in the 101 no patent side. And, and, and so even according to one study, you know, 78% of university researchers in the genetics field don't think there should be patents. 61% of those in industry don't think. So think about it. It's very different from, say, software, even though, I mean, a lot of software was developed people tinkering in the garage or whatever before it even looked like it would be patentable. Where here, people are going after things for Nobel Prizes and other reasons, huge federal funds. Do we, do we really you know, need this? Um, and in fact, uh, the person, uh, Mark Skolnick, who filed for the patent on the, B, the breast cancer, uh, the BRCA1 gene, had gotten federal funding for this so, you know, why am I not a stockholder in this, uh, you know, enterprise? In addition, he was part of a public consortium around the world that said they would make the gene public when they found it. He broke off right before it's about to be published and free for all of us and filed a patent on it. And so there's a different motivation for bioscience research. 
it, it's interesting, right? How, however that cost-benefit analysis shakes out, you know, my initial instinct when I heard the question or when I gave it some thought in light of the, of, of the decision we're talking about was, you know, at the end of the day, why are courts even making that call? That's something for exactly. Congress. And yet, <laughs> well, that, well, it seems that Justice Breyer all but invites us to weigh those considerations in, as part of the 101 analysis. So I, I think we have an opening <laughs> here. We might not have otherwise had. And, you know, as a, as a wrap-up comment, because I'm being given the time card, it, it's not just in this case that the court keeps coming back and saying these are public policy concerns. Every single case that's come along, not just that, but in the commentary with the AIA, there was a specific question for um, other questions, for, for when you can have uh, inter partes review initiated, and when you can do, when you can request re-exams, and when you can go to uh, uh, the patent office and the courts for other questions of public policy concern. Not those laid out in, in the patent statutes right, statutes right now, but those other concerns really are, should we be patenting genes? And actually, at some point, that question is going to come to an end because the human genome has indeed been all um, annotated. The genes are out there. The gene sequences are out there. And so, really, we mustn't forget that all patent law, all patents today in this day and age have a finite period of time. That 20-year monopoly is a 20-year monopoly. And really, with the majority of the genes that, the, 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 the patents that we're handling right now were patented way back when. After a while, there were, the academicians did come through and they did decide, you know, yeah, we're not going to patent all of these genes, not every single gene that we've ended up annotating. So I think the question is going to become moot over a certain period of time, but at some point Congress has to weigh in on the public policy issue, which the courts time and time and time again are saying it's not our bailiwick to comment on the public policy issue. And I think with that, uh, we'll end. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.